Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here, the host of this show, and I'm so excited. Every week I get to have great conversations with interesting CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of all kinds of different companies. Check out the back catalog because there's so many great conversations in there. I recently released my interview with the co-founder of Netflix. You've probably heard of that com company. Uh, YPO, EO, Activation, Blizzard, Lending Tree, Open Table. Check out some of those in the archives. There's some great episodes there. I'm also the co-founder of Rise25 where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And before I introduce today's guest, a quick shout out to Chris Kremitzos of PodFast Expo. Check out PodFast Expo. He's doing great things in the podcast space. But my guest is Caddy Doherty, Doherty, sorry, Doherty. She's an entrepreneur, an author, podcast host, and the president of Artisan Creative. It's a staffing and recruiting agency based in Los Angeles, focused on digital, creative, and marketing talent. And we connected also through the EO community, where she is a forum and retreat facilitator, working closely with entrepreneurs to become better versions of themselves. She recently published her memoir, The Butterfly, Butterfly Years, detailing her personal journey through grief towards hope. Caddy's on a mission to demystify grief and to create a space where we can talk about loss, grief, and death without feeling judged, nor feel we have to rush through to get over it. Caddy believes we all have a story to share and that our greatest journey is through self Discovery. She was raised in San Francisco, London, and Tehran, and she brings a multicultural perspective to all of her interactions. So we're going to get into that in a second and also talk about how businesses can cope through grief because it's something that she had to experience herself. Uh, before we get into that, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, where we help B2B businesses to get clients referrals and strategic partnerships with Done For You podcasts and content marketing. If you have any curiosity about starting a podcast, give us a call or shoot us an email, support at rise25media.com and happy to help. All right, Caddy, such a pleasure to have you here today. And you released your memoir recently, which was about um, a lot of loss that you experienced in a short period of time. First, catch us up with um, what you experienced. And then I'm really curious to know about how you help other companies that suffer a sudden loss, but need to keep on moving forward. You can't just hang up the business because one uh, person passes away. So uh, tell us about your personal experience though first. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I feel, you know, whenever I talk about this, this is not my core business. It has nothing to do with my business. However, it has everything to do with life. Right. And when I first experienced loss, it was right at the time when I had just taken over our business within a few months of both my parents and my stepmother passing away. They all died within four months of each other. And then I take over my business at the same time and trying to navigate, you know, trying to be a, you know, the positive front and the positive face to everyone and to clients and to talent. And yet inside, I was just so wrought. And, uh, you know, it, it was an interesting journey to try to figure out how to navigate loss. And what I really came to realize is that society, so at least in the Western society, you know, we have a hard time talking about grief and we certainly have a hard time talking about death although it's something that unfortunately touches us all. And that's kind of where the, the seed was planted to be able to create an opportunity and a space where people could talk about grief and loss and not feel as if, okay, it's time, you know, time, three days, you've mourned, it's enough, let's get back to work, because it just doesn't work that way. And uh, that's really kind of what the impetus of it was. Um, and I'm just thrilled that, the book was published. It took me three years to write it because 
it also was such a difficult topic to write. I had to relive everything in order to bring it back to on paper. So not many people want to do that. That must have been wrenching just to go through it again for the purpose of getting it down on paper. It was and it wasn't. It was you know, writing it and reliving it. There were many times when my husband would come into the you know, into my office and I would be like typing away just with tears coming down. Mm. But on the other side, it was very cathartic as well. It, I really look at it as an opportunity to finish some unfinished conversations and to be able to really share what was in my heart uh, and realize that back then when it first happened in 2011, I really didn't feel comfortable to share and certainly didn't, you know, and this is where self-judgment comes into play. I really didn't feel as if anyone wanted to hear it again and again and again. I had said it once, but then I kind of, you know, didn't really want to talk about it again because others, I could see, I could see it was too much information for, for so many other people people. It's just an uncomfortable topic. Yeah. So I just made it my mission to demystify it, as you, as you said in the intro, you know, but let's talk about it. You, um, your husband started Artisan Creative mm -hmm. and in 2012, he stepped away and you stepped in as president, not an easy job under any circumstances. Um, if you, as you look back at it now, knowing what you know now, would you have done things differently when you went through that loss and when you were a newly installed president? Are there any choices that you would have done differently or that you would advise someone in similar circumstance now? No, uh, actually, I think taking over the business and just diving in head first really was my salvation in that I was so busy and I had such a purpose to make sure that I was handling you know, this transition smoothly, not only for our clients, but more importantly for my own employees, our, our internal team, that it was super helpful to have it. And one of the big lessons that I learned when I was going through loss is to just say yes to everything. You know, we have this one life to live and the opportunities at hand. And this was a huge opportunity from a career perspective for me. I had worked at the company for, at the time, close to 12 years. And I had been running and kind of do, I had worn pretty much every single hat uh, from HR to recruiting, to sales, to you name it. And I had been the managing director for a number of years before I took it over. So no, it was, it, it came at the perfect time, even though at the time it probably didn't seem it, but now in retrospect, it was a brilliant, brilliant opportunity. What was it like going from um, running the business, probably from its infancy, I imagine, um, with your husband there and then for him stepping away and, and not being there as actively as he was? It was interesting. I'll, I'll step back a little bit to when I first started working for the company. You know, I had my own career in retail and had managed a, a big, uh, you know, several big departments in a larger department store. And I had a, a big budget that I was responsible for. So when I first came to work with Jamie, my husband, that was the interesting thing. That was the interesting thing to be able to really separate. Uh, where the work relationship and where the personal relationship is. And I don't know how many of your audience members here work with their partners or with their spouse, but that was a huge lesson. I had to, I, I remember I had to actually physically, you know, I would step into, as if I would step into the elevator, for example, and in my mind say, okay, no more work, talk, no more home talk. Now it's work talk. And then the reverse in the evening say, okay, no more work talk. Now it's home talk and had to really put boundaries and barriers in place so that work life and life life didn't it's all meld into one. And when we, when we first did the transition, you know, I felt such a sense of responsibility and so, such so much gratitude for this opportunity. I wanted to make sure that I handled this, this gift, this baby 
properly. The, in the first year, I remember kept going to Jamie and saying, hey, I'm trying to do this. Or I'm making this decision. What do you think? Is it cool? Until one day he said, you know what? There's a reason I stepped out and you've stepped in, you know, just, just run with it. And I think I just needed to hear that validation uh, and, you know, just a recognition that I was doing it the right way uh, before I felt as if I could really take flight. Right, right. Yeah. You're fortunate because it, certainly many business owners kind of don't want to give up the reins or maybe second guessing things that the person who takes over from them is doing. Yeah, for sure. And I think that when it comes to partnership, you know, any kind of family relationship, right? Whether it's siblings working together or a parent and a child working together, or in this case, spouses working together, there is such a such an important conversation to, to have because it's easy to mix our roles with each other, right? If someone mm -hmm. has, a, has a challenge with an RFP, for example, and they're questioning something, it's hard to not confuse, like, is that my brother talking to me yeah. or is that my spouse talking to me? So to be able to really have clear, defined conversations and boundaries and roles is something that I highly recommend to anyone who's working with a best friend, a family member, because it, it, it can get very, very, the waters can get muddy. For sure. Right, right, right. Um, talk to me about what it, the experience has been like for you it, to take that hat off, but, but to focus on your work with forums and businesses that have suffered loss and what that experience has been like. Maybe you could take us through, if you can think of some examples of um, instances where you've come in, you've helped either a forum or a business, you know, to reveal their um, uh, identifying, you know, who they are or anything like that, of course. But, but what, how do you take them through? How do you help um, whether a business or a forum that suffered some kind of loss? What do you do? Well, my specialty is as a facilitator, you know, in whatever environment, whether it's in EO, whether in a forum, or if I'm working with a business, is really to create a safe space so that people feel comfortable so they can share. And that, you know, regardless of whether they're sharing their most intimate thoughts about their business or they're talking about their most intimate thoughts about a loss, um, the, the whole thing starts with trust and really creating safety so that they can come to the table and share. So in instances where I've had the opportunity to talk to groups, regardless of what the topic has been, I think that's really the strength to be able to have everybody get into a space and into a mindset that they're, they're okay with not being okay, right? It's, it, they're okay with being vulnerable and to really talk about things that are really deep in their in their hearts and to share from there so that that really is it um i don't it's really not a different technique because the topic is different um the whole thing comes from just making sure that somebody is comfortable and feels safe enough to be able to share and and then do you take them through a process or is it just kind of giving them the opportunity to i don't know vent is the right word but to talk it through yeah, so it depends. It depends on how the loss has occurred, whether it was sudden, whether it was an illness, whether people had the chance to say goodbye, whether they didn't have that opportunity. So there's various exercises to be able to take people through, depending on kind of what stage they're at. You know, the the early the early days of of grief. You know, it's so raw that uh, again, depending on the relationship that they had with the person who's passed it may not be the right time. Uh, and, you know, if, if it's the latter stages of grief, then it's, again, it's a different conversation and a different relationship. So it's very much custom based on who the group is, what the relationship with the loss was and how the loss occurred. Uh, but it's really just to make sure people know that it's okay that they're still grieving mm -hmm. that, and it's okay that they're, you know, that they haven't said their goodbyes and to create a space where they can do that. Right. Right. Um, I want to um, take a step backwards to the origins of Artisan Creative. Um, how, did, uh, how did it start? Yeah, so my brother-in-law, actually, uh, Bijan, uh, started Artisan Talent. And 
Jamie joined him about six months later. And then after a few years, they decided to separate. And, and my brother-in-law still operates uh, Artisan Talent. And that's mostly in New York and in Chicago. So on the Eastern hemisphere or Eastern side of the US. And Artisan Creative is more focused on the Western side of the US. So we operate uh, primarily on the staffing side of it is here in California, but on the direct hire, full-time recruiting or projects-based work is you know, all over, all over the U.S. So that's how it started is really my brother-in-law that um, brought it forth and then Jamie joined it and then and, and, I joined it. And explain to us the, the, the types of roles that you place for. And then I want to get into talking about some of the changes that you've seen over your 20 years working in the field, because there's so, such changes have happened in the digital world, you know, mm-hmm. all the different social platforms that are out there these days. But um, what types of like positions, particularly, if you could share what you work on? I know it's like art directors, creative directors, graphic designers, stuff like that, correct? Yep, exactly. UI, UX people, copywriters, content strategists, uh, cop- you know, um, social media strategists, brand strategists marketing managers. So really any, any team, any creative department or advertising agency design firm that has a creative output, we, we place the people that can be all, all through that chain, whether it's they're on the account side of it or they're on the actual design side of it. So as long as the output is a creative output, that's where we specialize in. Okay. And how have, how has things changed for you given like over the last 20 years, you know, um, I mean, I remember my first job after college was through Apple. Something was the name of the, like a staffing agency. I got Apple one. Thank you. Yes. Apple one. I remember. And I went and I registered for a bunch of different temp and staffing agencies after college and got placed different places and stuff. But now there's marketplaces online. How has that affected your business and the the markets that you go after? Yeah, thanks for asking. Well, I would say the biggest change really it has occurred this past year with with virtual work, yeah. right? With what yeah. COVID brought forth. Yeah, and we're recording this, by the way, for those who listen to it in the future, May of 2021. So after a year of pandemic, go ahead. Yeah. So we've been a remote office for 11 years. And when we first went remote, when the 2008, 2009 uh, downturn, economic downturn had happened, our, the building that we had been in for 14 years got sold. And suddenly we were like, ah, we're, we're, we're out of here. And we tried to this virtual thing and weren't quite sure how it was going to work. And it worked beautifully. But back then, anytime that was, that's we would- pre Slack, pre so many different tools. Yeah, right. Yeah. Zoom, pre Zoom. Oh, pre Zoom for sure. Yeah. And anytime we would tell someone that we were, go- we were virtual or we were going remote, they were like, are you running? Are you still okay. in business? Right? <laughs> and to see that. Don't say fashion, that anymore. <laughs> right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So when the pandemic first hit, what we realized was that, oh my gosh, like we have so many clients that have not even thought about what would a remote workforce look like. So we actually jumped in and started doing some webinars for people and teach, you know, sharing with them what is it that we had learned over the years. Wow. And and not even, not even related to the work that you do exactly, I guess. That's just kind of like sharing wisdom. Yeah. I love that. Because people were panicking, right? People were like, oh my God, like I thought people working from home and we're like, it's totally cool. You can, yeah. you, you can do this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my company is fully virtual too. So it's like, settle down. It's okay. It'll be fine. Yeah, you'll you'll love your sweatpants soon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> That's funny. And uh, so, so from that perspective, it's obviously changed quite a bit. And now we're looking at what the future of work can be, you know, whether it's a hybrid model where some people are in the office, some people come into the office every few days. And it's really opened up the talent pool where we're now seeing people not necessarily being limited to geography. And, you know, if it's a California company, but they can work with somebody in you know, in the Midwest, then so be it. They're they're open to that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there in terms of expansion of the workforce. Of course, people have to work harder in terms of creating culture and making sure people are coming together regularly, whether it's virtual Zoom retreats and gatherings and things like that. 
uh, as we've had to do in EO as well, right? So it's yeah. you know, the two do yeah. go hand in hand. But in terms of the business arc, I remember the days of the X-Acto knives and the spray mount. I mean, I'm, I'm dating myself here, people out there. Um, <laughs> but you know, with the with the you know, with pre Photoshop, in other words, right? pre Photoshop, yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Coral draw, doing and, things by uh, hand, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, so what? Go ahead. I was going to. What I've seen probably the biggest change is this collaboration between technology and design. You know, before they were on their own paths, but now, especially with UI, UX, you know, you just see this interaction of the two of them together. One, it can't just look pretty. It has to be form and function. And that that's, I think, where we're seeing big, big changes, uh, at, both on the talent side, the various skills that they're bringing to the table, as well as what the clients are asking for. Mm. And, um, you know, there, there are some who have argued that there's been this a downward pressure in the marketplace with, with big marketplaces, the fibers of the world. Um, has that influenced your business or has that influenced the markets, the, the clients that you served, uh, that you serve? Yeah, I think when it first came on to, you know, came into reality, fiber, upwork, all of those. And to be honest, how that works for a lot of people, that's perfectly fine. They probably were never going to be attracted to the type of service that we offer anyway. And, you know, we've had people who've come to us as a, for, from a recruitment stance and we just weren't not the right partner for them. So what it has done, I think it's just really gotten clarity for us as to who is the right partner for us and who we can be the right partner for. We're all about relationships. Uh, the, the beauty, I think the business that we're in, we just celebrated 25 years this past February. And many of our talent and clients have been with us for, you know, in the double digits in terms of years. So that's the niche that we're bringing to the table. It's not just throwing resumes at the dart and hope that one sticks. It's really getting ingrained with an understanding what a client's culture is and who would be the right fit and what is what problem do they have that they're trying to solve. And if a 99 cent design is gonna be the right situation for them and the right solution for them, then so be it. We, we won't be the right solution in that instance. So it's interesting, it's been, uh, I think, revealed as to who re really is our core client and who isn't and who we can be a partner with and who we can. Right. <clears throat> there are unique challenges to being in the field that you're in, both in terms of the talent that you're placing, creative people have a certain, what do, how do we describe it? Reputation, you know, um, how do you deal with that? And, and then also just the nature of creative work being oftentimes subjective is is that a challenge for you in terms of placing quality people and and dealing with um, you know that subjectivity being an, an issue in the nature of what you do? Mm -hmm. I'll answer your first question first. I love being w working with creative people, and I love the way they look at the world. I love the way that they're not in a box, and uh, that the ideation and the creativity is just oozes and I'm not a creative myself, but I call myself, I call me a creative groupie. So I, li <laughs> I like to be around creative talent. And on the second piece, you're absolutely right. Creativity is subjective. Art is subjective. And where I think we specialize when we do the placements is really get an understanding as to not only what the client's aesthetic is about, but what the client's client's aesthetic is about. Because oftentimes we're placing someone let's say at a design firm, and they're going to be working on a particular brand, a particular client for, for that particular um, agency. So really having an understanding, because if somebody says they want design and design of somebody who's designing for Disney is very different than the design of somebody who's designing for, for Apple, right? They're both yeah. graphic designers, but really understanding what it is that that, that aesthetic requires that's the key. That's the key of really understanding who your client is and who the talent is and what is it that they're bringing to the table. Yeah. Now, um, there's so many different 
emerging fields that are just having such dramatic impact on the business world these days from e-commerce to all the different social media channels that are coming along. It, it, it seems that there's so much more demand for creativity and creative work. There's need for images, there's need for photography, there's need for writing. Talk to me a little bit about the, the way in which this is just changing the landscape and the marketplace and, and the types of needs that you're fulfilling for clients right now. We've seen a shift in, well, obviously social media and its growth has been astronomical and it's not just social for the sake of posting something on Instagram. It's social from an audience engagement standpoint. It's from a uh, client acquisition standpoint. So really understanding the creativity and how that uh, kind of marries the the ROI. As I was saying earlier, it can't just be pretty for the sake of being pretty. There has to be a data component to it. There has to be an ROI component to it. Um, I think at least where where people are coming to us for the roles that they're looking to place, um, it has that component. It has to be, there has to be the business understanding behind creativity versus just just design me a logo. That, no, I mean, to your point, maybe they can go to Fiverr or Upwork for, for that. But when they're coming to us, it's really understanding the business of creativity and, uh, making sure that the, the creative that's being created has impact and there's ROI to it. So it's pretty really fascinating. Marriage between, yeah, really marriage between the business side and the creative side. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. We see so much in the data side of it, data analy- analytic side of it, when it comes to design and you know how many clicks, how many opens, how many, you know, all the A-B testing that goes along with with the, the creative. It's, it's pretty fascinating how you know, that full circle of design and creativity and analytics and technology all have come together. Yeah, it, it's fascinating to me the types of personalities that are able to balance those different pieces. You know, someone who it, it's almost like people need to have both a creative side and an analytical side in order to be really good at those types of um, skills that are in demand these days. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And also, I think realistically some companies you know want a unicorn you know unicorns do exist there's just not that many of them yeah and to be able to really recognize that okay maybe i do need two people because i need one person to focus on this and another to focus on this yes they'll intersect but there's you know sometimes it's not one person that can do it all Right, right. And I imagine that's part of just, you have to explain it to people or yeah. get them to buy into that understanding. Yeah, you have yeah. to kind of just consult with them and help them understand what is, is the job description, what's a must have versus a nice to have and right. really be able to focus on that. Yeah. Right. Well, we're running short of time. I want to um, wrap up with the question I love enjoying, uh, enjoy asking, which is, um, uh, and I'm a big fan of gratitude. So if you look around, particularly at your peers and contemporaries, and I don't think we often do this, but take the time to single them out and acknowledge them for the work that they do. But if you, however you want to define that, if you look at your peers and contemporaries, who's out there doing good work that you really respect and admire the work that they're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So I do gratitude every day. And uh, that's actually one of the things that helped me get through you know, when, and when I was through, going through the grieving processes was just looking around and just realizing what I still had versus I, what I didn't have. So I'm a big, big fan of gratitude as you are, John. And one of my contemporaries that um, I'll do a shout out for that I'm so grateful for everything she does is a woman actually from EO. Uh, her name is Winnie Hart. And she has a brand, branding agency called Twin Engine and really making a difference in terms of um, honing in on what people do to stand out. So she's currently working on how do you stand out as a thought leader, for example. And I've always admired her from uh, a business perspective uh, and also from a creative perspective. Um, But also what I really admire her for is she's just one of those people that sees and recognizes the spark in others and really helps foster 
people to get to the next stage of, of their lives. And so I'll do a shout out to Winnie. What's her website? So people can go check it out. Do you know? Twin Engine. Twin Engine. Okay. Twin Engine. Great. Excellent. Um, artisancreative.com. The Butterfly Years is the name of the book, which you can go check out, I imagine, on Amazon and yep. wherever you, you get your books. And where can people go check out the podcast? The podcast is called The Artisan Podcast. And you can find it on, on iTunes or if you go on the Artisan Creative site, you'll be able to find it that way as well. Excellent. All right. Caddy, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much. John, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.